What's up, Refuge family? Welcome back to another Refuge Daily. My name's Noah, um, and I'm going to be finishing up uh, kind of this series I've been going through with my junior hires and explaining it to you guys. We already finished the series about a week ago, um, but the series canceled. If you guys remember, this is talking about the phenomenon called cancel culture, basically a big jumbled up situation of online behaviors, some helpful and justified and others not. Uh, such as calling out, shaming, boycotting, and holding people accountable for their actions. It kind of starts started on social media where people wanted to cancel certain individuals, mainly celebrities and political figures, uh, for things that they did, things that they didn't agree with. Um, but we translated that into real life and the situation that we face where we want to cancel others based off of what they're doing or who they are or how whether they're rude people, people that we're annoyed with, people that we hate, people that we're envious of, all of those situations and instead we're learning how to love in those situations instead of canceling or removing so the big idea i want to talk about today is loving the people you want to hate um very important thing love is a huge topic that we need to really digest and hold on to as believers especially if we are in situations where we have people that we really dislike people that we hate um, so whether it's online in our, in, or in our families or in family circles, or not family circles, circles of friends, there's never a shortage of people um, we love to hate, especially when we feel there's a good reason for that hatred. Um, when someone hurts us, it's tempting to cancel them by loving to hate them, talking poorly about them, dehumanizing them, taking revenge on them. This isn't this this is complicated um, because when we're hurt, of course we want to stick up for ourselves, hold people accountable for their actions. But God also calls us to forgive and show grace rather than seeking revenge. So the questions that can arise from that: so how do we balance accountability with grace and forgiveness? Or does forgiving someone mean pretending like the hurt that happened from that individual never happened? Or when do we need to seek justice and when do we need to just let something go? What is the where's the line there? Um, so last time I was on here, we heard the story of David and King Saul, focusing mostly on Saul. Uh, this week, we're going to look at the same story, but focus on David. And in case you need to recap, Saul was the king of Israel, the first king, um, but David had been chosen by God to be the next king. And Saul liked David at first, but eventually he became incredibly envious of David. Because of this envy, Saul tried to kill David repeatedly, over and over again. He even rallied his army of soldiers to help um, him hunt down and kill David. And so you can really, we can all agree, David had a valid reason to hate King Saul. And it would uh, have been totally reasonable for David to want revenge. But here's what happened instead. David responded not with revenge, but with love. And that kind of flipped the whole situation into a completely different story and really reflected God's heart uh, on what it means to love as believers. So 1 Samuel Chapter 24, verses 1 through uh, 7. Now it happened, when Saul had returned from following the Philistines, that it was told to him, saying, Take note, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road, there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. He was using the restroom. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave, so way back deep in the cave where Saul couldn't probably see. Um, David and his men were hiding back there. Then the men of David said to him, This is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. Two things. First, yes, Saul was using the bathroom. Kind of funny. Second, not only did David not kill Saul, he did not even hurt him. He cut off a piece of his, his robe as evidence, but he even felt remorseful about that and left, and then he let Saul live in peace. Just leave in peace. Crazy. It's, it's madness. Like, I, I probably would have taken out Saul right then and there. When David had the opportunity, though, to take revenge and let hate guide him, he chose to let Saul go instead. And in this moment, David chose to love and 
He chose to love Saul in spite of his actions. And that doesn't mean David suddenly liked Saul or wanted to be his friend, but David showed love instead of hate by showing mercy to Saul instead of revenge. Like I mentioned before, David and Saul didn't exactly reconcile afterward. The, the best that they could do was promise to stay away from each other. And they did. Um, for the rest of their, their lives, they, they never saw uh, each other. Um, crazy. What's the lesson from this story? And, you know, actually the lesson from this story, uh, it's helpful when reading Old Testament stories to look ahead to the words of Jesus and see how they relate between the two. Um, and what sort of virtues were being con um, put on David's heart, what sort of prompting from the Holy Spirit was being put on him. Um, Matthew 5, verses 38 through 45 say, say, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too, and give to him who asks you from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the, on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. In this passage, as Jesus often did, he flipped the script of the world's wisdom about love and hate. And instead of telling his audience to love those who love them and hate those who hate them, Jesus challenges them and us to try something completely new, to love our enemies. And although David lived many years before Jesus spoke these words, David understood God wouldn't want him to return Saul's hatred with more hatred. His decision to show Saul love instead of vengeance points to Jesus' challenge um, what he challenges us to do, love the people we want to hate. So when Jesus said to turn the other cheek, he wasn't just telling us to get over it. Um, good thing to note, he was telling us to strategically choose love instead of hatred because love changes things. So um, from here, from this point, and the, there's a couple more topics that we discussed in junior high with the kids and kind of diving into the deeper sort of meanings of what that passage really held and what it means to love. Um, but one of the things that we kind of concluded that one of the best ways to love our enemies is to pray for our enemies. We first started, okay, so who are your enemies? Who are you tempted to hate? Who have you hurt? How can you stop the back and forth exchange of hatred and retaliation? How can you strategically choose to love someone you want to hate? Um, because when someone hurts us, it's natural to want to cancel them and make them pay. That is just our human sinful nature to be like, hey, they hurt me. Excuse me, I have like these hiccups. <clears throat> but it's possible to hold someone accountable for their actions without adding to the hatred in the world. The world needs us to model a new way forward, and that's a way of love, not hate. It will be challenging, but the most important things are this change can start with us when we decide to do a couple things that I had all the students write down. Number one, forgive. The first thing that we can do in loving our enemies is to forgive. Forgiveness isn't something we do for the person who hurt us, by the way. It's something we do for ourselves and God. Whether they've asked for our forgiveness or not, we can choose to let go of bitterness toward the people who have hurt us. And you may not be ready to fully forgive that person um, that, that has hurt you, and that's okay. Forgiveness is often a journey. But that's the first step. Forgiving, letting go, moving on. So to forgive the person that we hate. Second one, to notice. We all need people to model for us what compassion and love look like. But the good news is that these examples are everywhere. There are so many leaders in my life, people here at Refuge, who have clearly demonstrated what love looks like. How can we embody that love? How can we share that love with everybody we meet? So look around. Take a look around. Look at Jesus' example. It's the best example you could possibly have, and it's in the format of a book. It's really great. Um, so forgive, notice. Third one, defend. Talked a lot about what to do when we've been hurt and, and showing love, but don't forget that other people are being hurt all the time. Um, and I, I told the students, think about maybe someone, um, notice someone who's been bullied at school or maybe um, you might begin as they grew up and they might begin to explore the deep and systemic problems like injustice racism inequality all those things um, if you were David being hunted by the king you would have wanted someone to defend you 
And we can do that for others. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. We can encourage, we can uplift, we can cry with those who need to be cried with. There's all these different concepts of things that we can go through that we can depend on each other for, which is a beautiful thing. So forgive, notice, defend. Last one, um, as I mentioned briefly, pray. The things we talked about today are difficult. They're not easy. But if we want to choose love instead of hate, we're going to need a lot of help. We have to learn to pray for those who hurt us or who are hurting others, just like Jesus did. It's a hard challenge, okay? It's hard to hate someone you're constantly praying for. I will also say, as um, I kind of close with this, I want to challenge you to pray for the person you're most tempted to hate right now. Ask God to help you choose love instead of revenge, instead of bitterness and all those things. Choose love instead. Pray for that individual. It's a great thing to do. It helps us grow as believers. It provides integrity of character for us. So that's my encouragement for you guys. I hope it was a blessing. Um, love all you guys, praying for all you guys, and thank you so much for, for being a faithful family here at Refuge. Have a good one.